Hello, Augusta. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to downtown Augusta. What do you see? It's not a trick question. It's, it's pretty visually non-stimulating. It's a gray rectangle against a white background. Let's change things up a little bit. What do you see now? Something happened. It changed. I changed the rectangle. You're going to think I'm crazy. I didn't change the rectangle at all. It's the same monochromatic, gray, boring rectangle. I changed the background. I changed our perception of the rectangle. That happened in a tenth of a second. That's called a neural lag. A tenth of a second is not much of a lag at all, but it's a lag nonetheless. Our brain wants the world to make sense. And our brain will alter our perceptions in some ways fallaciously in order for that to happen. I'll take the background away. And in that tenth of a second neural lag, it goes back to just being a boring old gray rectangle. Change the background, change the image. If you think I'm lying, if you could make the shape of the rectangle with your fingers or with a couple of credit cards, uh, iPhone, two small children, something, and, and if you could isolate the background, then you'd see that your perception is indeed um, fallacious in this case. So we said that weird word, neural lag. What happens during that time? Light goes from the eye to that little red part in the back of the brain. That's your visual center. And then it goes around to the side of the brain, the what pathway, to determine what things are. What is it? It's a rectangle. And then it goes up to the top of the head, to the where pathway, to determine where things are. It's up there. And so that's, that all happens in a tenth of a second. And that's how long it takes for us to perceive what we're looking at. Let's have another example. You can see where this is going. The darker square up top, square A, is darker than the lighter square in the middle, square B. Well, our brain wants that to be the case because square A is surrounded by lighter color squares. It's got to be darker, right? I'm going to perceive that as a darker color gray. Square B is surrounded by darker color squares. It's got to be lighter, right? You can see where this is headed. If I connect the two, you'll see that in about a tenth of a second, we are, are the, the, the illusion breaks down and we see it for what it is, which is exactly the same color. I take it away, tenth of a second, two different colors. And we'll put it back together one more time. As an aside, the same science can be applied to that blue dress. I think it's blue that was online. Is it blue? Is it gold? Is it white? Is it black? I'm with the 33% that said it was blue. It's the same science behind that. So when I say that our brains control how we see the world, what I mean quite literally, and I'll, uh, I'll say that when the reggae rapper Matis Yahu said, you're a slave to yourself and you don't even know, he, he was telling the truth. He was actually, his, his, his proportions were indeed correct, although this is probably not what he had in mind. But our brains will control how we see the world, and they will alter our perceptions in order for the world to make sense. This is especially evident when the brain breaks down. I'll get you oriented. What you're doing right now is you're sitting inside of a person's brain, and you're looking out through each of that person's eyes onto how that person sees the world. And the black areas are where you're not seeing so hot. So you see, looking through this person's brain, out on how they see the world, that up and to the right, it, it, there's some areas where they're not seeing. And these patients are aware of that. There's a defect, there's a glitch, there's a deficit, and they're aware of it, they perceive it, they're worried about it. And they should be worried about it. This is a hemianopsia. The number two causes, the numbers one and two causes of this are stroke and brain tumor. Those are things that are worth being concerned about. These patients come in worried and they perceive this. Doc, I don't see things on my right side. Um, I bump into things on my right side. A bird has to get right here before I see it. A car coming, a person crossing the street, they have a defect and they perceive it, they're aware of it. Sometimes the brain breaks down and we're not aware of it. This is a different beast altogether. This is called hemineglect. This is when the brain breaks down and our perception breaks down along with it. If a person comes in with hemineglect, you can show them a picture of a clock. You can say, Copy the clock. 
give them a pencil and a piece of paper. And if they have a left hemi neglect, they'll only draw half of the clock. They'll only draw the right half of the clock. And you'll ask them, why, why, why didn't you draw the whole clock? And they'll look at you puzzled. You buffoon, you only showed me half of a clock. It just doesn't even register. And it goes beyond vision. These people may only shave half of their face. They completely ignore part of the world, and they don't perceive that they're doing so. So the brain breaks down in this case, and our perception breaks down along with it. Hemi neglect, different beast altogether. So our brain governs how we see the world. Our brain governs how we perceive the world. Our brain wants things to make sense. And our brain will fill in gaps where there are gaps, and it will make order out of chaos. So you, you, you can see I've done something cute, I've inserted a couple of typos, but you're able to get the gist because your brain's able to fill in the gaps. Is perception truly reality? And the answer is a resounding, you know, yes and no. I see an upside down white triangle, and you can't tell me it's not there. You can tell me all day long, okay, well, there's been, uh, there are three Pac-Men, and then there are these three, like, 60-degree angle things, and that's all that's on the screen. That's an upside down white triangle. And I can't make myself not see it. I can't tell that triangle to go away because my brain sees those gaps and it fills them in and it creates order out of chaos. I'd rather see an upside down white triangle that makes sense to me than, you know, sense six uh, nonsensical figures on a screen. I want things to be built up, things to have enthalpy, things to have order. And my brain will adjust how I see things accordingly. So the brain will always look at something, white triangle, before it looks at nothing, a bunch of gobbledygook on a screen. And this ties into babies. People ask me, you know, how can you check vision on a neonate, a baby, someone who has had a traumatic brain injury, somebody who cannot communicate to you? And the answer is, we always use the principle of the brain will look at something before it looks at nothing. So I'll get you oriented. This is a parent holding a baby, and on the right side, there's some bar gratings. There's something there. And on the left side, there's nothing there. And there's a screen. And there's a peephole that I get to sit behind, if I ever do this. And when you lift the screen up, in that tenth of a second, in that neural lag, you look at where the baby's eyes go. Don't pay attention to anything after that tenth of a second. Because then, you know, it's a baby. There's other stuff going on. And so, where that baby's eyes go, is what that baby wants to see. And if the baby can perceive that there are bars there, as opposed to looking at nothing, the baby will look at something. And then we make the bars smaller, harder to see, we give them a higher spatial frequency, and so the baby doesn't really care which side he or she looks to, and that's how we know the limit of a baby's vision. The brain will always look at something before it looks at nothing. So this is all vision in the present. This is all things that we presently perceive. What about vision in the future? Can we use our vision to predict the future? The answer is a resounding absolutely, and you're all doing it right now, so am I. We're constantly predicting the future with all of our senses, but, but, but to a much higher degree visually. This is the herring phenomenon. This is a really cool one. There's these two red bars, right? And these blue radial spokes. The bars are parallel, but if you pay attention to the middle of the bars, they may tend to bow out just a little bit. And they're not really bowed, they're actually parallel the whole way down the screen, but our brain is attempting to predict the future. The brain is looking at these blue radial spokes like it's a hallway. If this illusion works on you, which it works on most people, you're trying to walk down that hallway. And as your brain gets closer to those parallel red bars, they will appear further apart. They will subtend a larger angle. It's like if I'm looking at the back of the theater, I see the door frame. You know, it's, it's about like this. I can pinch it right now, you know? And as I walk closer to it, it appears bigger, and it subtends a larger angle. So that's why the parallel red lines appear to bow out a little bit, because your brain's trying to look into the future where it thinks you're going to be a tenth of a second from now. So we visually predict the future all the time, sometimes fallaciously. We, yeah, where, what's he going to do now? The, uh, so vision, vision in the present, vision in the future. What about vision based on past experience? I'm going to pick on Toddles the Clown for a second, and I don't mean anything personally. I'm sure he's a great guy. 
Um, when I look at them, you know, in that tenth of a second neural lag, I decide how I feel emotionally. And I'll explain why that happened so quickly in just a second. You know, I, 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 I'm thinking he's got a smile painted on his face, but he's not smiling. He looks like he's smirking at some kid. Uh, he's got these tears painted on his cheeks. Why is the hat so small? Why would you wear a hat that small? It doesn't keep anything out of your eyes. That, uh, that isn't even feng shui. What's he doing? And it's chaotic. It's, it's disorganized, and I'm not comfortable with it. I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just not a clown person, so I'm not going to feel a positive emotion. If I were a clown myself, or if I was raised by a family of clowns, or I was raised in the circus, or I was married to a clown, I'm sure I would feel different. Nothing against clowns. I'm just not a clown person and don't feel I need an intellectual reason. Uh, so vis <laughs> vision and uh, emotion go hand in hand. And they do so through this weird, quirky pathway called the limbic system. The brain is full of all these pathways. And they're malleable, they're plastic, they can change over time. And one of those pathways is the limbic system. And the limbic system has a lot to do with how we feel about what we see based on past experience. So, light goes to the back of the brain, which is that little pink area, right, right there. And then it goes around the side of that green area, the what pathway. What is it? It's a clown. When those fibers go in, in, into that what is it pathway, they go very, very close to some fibers from the limbic system. So how you feel about something and how you determine what something is visually is really close from an anatomical perspective. Okay? So let's put it all together. We started with the simplest of images. It's a gray rectangle, right? We talk about the present, the future, and then we base things on past experience. Let's use all three of those. And let's figure out this ridiculously complex image. So let's look at the data. Let's, let's look at the information. My brain likes the red scarf. That's what my brain goes to first. It likes the contrast between the black coat and the red and the white of the ice. That's what my brain looks at. My brain also pays a little bit of attention to the blue skates behind the young lady smiling at us. Oh, she's smiling at us. So based on past experience, we know that that means that she probably likes us, unless she's being sarcastic, which is a whole other TEDx talk altogether. I can predict the future a little bit. I can see that everybody is basically going this way. And the guy with the, uh, with the blue skates on, he, he's a little blurrier. He's probably going faster. If I close my eyes, one, two, open my eyes, he's probably going to be on the other side of the figure. It looks cold. It looks icy. It looks like it's nighttime. That's all information. That's all data. Information and data are wonderful but they don't move people. Emotions move people. Now, I can tell you from an emotional perspective exactly what this is, because I'm the one who took this picture. And the figure in the front smiling at us with the red scarf is my beautiful wife. And I can tell you exactly when this was. This was Christmas Eve, 2007. We were living in New York and didn't have enough time to fly home for the holidays. And so we went out to eat, we walked over to Bryant Park, and we went ice skating. And you're looking visually at one of the happiest moments of my entire life that I was able to snap and go back to. I have this hanging above my desk in the office. So when you leave, look at someone you love. Look at a parent, a spouse, a partner, a best friend, a sibling, a child, a dog, a cat, a hamster, somebody, somebody that you love and think about how much has to go perfectly correct in that tenth of a second neural lag for you to look at that person and just feel good. Think about everything that has to happen in a succinct fashion in that seemingly ridiculously short lag, we'll call it, just for you to look at that person and think, I love that person. What a wonderful moment this is. And then maybe you'll agree with me that vision is the most profound, significant and precious of all the senses. Thank you very much.